Well, welcome everyone to Dementia Chats. Um, today we're going to have a really interesting discussion about depression and dementia, kind of the chicken or the egg theory, which comes first or is there first. But before we get into our topic, um, we are going to introduce ourselves. I'm Lori LeBay. I'm the, the founder of Alzheimer's Speaks, and I also uh, cared for my mother, uh, who was diagnosed with dementia for 30 years, um, which was life-changing. Um, basically, it's because of her I started Alzheimer's Speaks and Dementia Chats. I, I feel this platform is critical for the world to really hear from those diagnosed uh, because their insights are so, so powerful and so helpful. Um, to the rest of us who are caring and trying to figure out how to how to best be supportive. Harry, do you mind introducing yourself, please? Uh, my name's Harry Urban. Uh, I live in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm the founder of Forget Me Not. I was diagnosed with uh, with dementia 13 years ago of the Alzheimer's type. And I think every day of my life since then, I've been grumbling and growling about it. Okay, great. Thank you. Lori, can you introduce yourself, please? My name is Lori Scher. I'm from Pennsylvania. Uh, at the age of 55, I was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and frontotemporal de degeneration. Okay. Um, Brian, can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, my name is Brian LeBlanc. Um, I live in Pensacola, Florida. I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in October of 14, um, and I am an international dementia advocate with several of uh, nonprofit organizations throughout the country and globally. Okay, great. And True? My full legal name is Truthful Loving Kindness. My current diagnosis is mild cognitive impairment with strong symptoms of Lewy body and vascular dementia. Great, thank you. Bob, you want to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name is uh, Bob Savage. I live in uh, Farmington, uh, Connecticut. Uh, I was diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's with some degree of vascular dementia about uh, two years ago now. And there's been, I've only been noticed significant, some changes in the past two, three months. And uh, so depression to me is a very important, interesting topic. Okay, great. Thank you. Susan? Hi, I'm Susan Session. I'm in Oklahoma. I was diagnosed at the age of 48 with early onset Alzheimer's. And uh, approximately four years ago, an additional diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia and primary progressive aphasia. Okay. Well, great. Well, I, like I said, I think our topic today is going to be really interesting and eye-opening because the topic of uh, depression and dementia, which comes first? Do they come together? Are they, uh, do they rely on one another? Are they independent? And, and how does it not only affect the person with dementia, but those that are caring for them as well? Um, we're going to try to cover a lot of ground here in, in this next, uh, you know, 55 minutes. So, Lori, I'm going to let you kick it off because you're the one that brought this topic up. and. Um, why do you think this is a, an important discussion to have? Because I think that when you go from working full time, making money, being able to do things, being able to drive, um, and then suddenly you can't, there, it, it does open life up to being depressed, you go through your grieving process of, I can't do this anymore, but then depression off and on just tends to sink in and it's like you, you want to go do something and then you think, oh no, I can't drive that far or I can't do it because of my dementia. So I think depression just has a way of constantly sneaking into our lives. Um, I was not a person that had any problems with depression prior to my diagnosis. Since then, yeah, I go through periods where I'm, I'm sad and, and depressed, and I have to kick myself in the tush and say, okay, Laurie, pick yourself up. You're not going to live like this. You're not going to let it rule you. 
and it, it's hard sometimes. It's hard when you're angry because you can't remember how to play the guitar when you've played the guitar for 50 years and then suddenly you can't play. It's hard not to become depressed. So that's why I think that's, I think it's important that we talk about this and it is a real part of dementia. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things we want to cover too are um, any tips um, or ideas people have found, you know, to, to pull ourselves out of depression um, because you know, nobody wants to stay there. Um, True, you had a comment? I think it's difficult to know where grief ends and depression begins because grief, the grief process is very important and crucial to accepting our disabilities and the uh, recognition of need for workaround and motivation for finding workarounds of our disabilities. If we don't th go through that grief, then we can't reach that point. And where does the grief end and the depression begin? Especially because some, like my family, um, has a chemical imbalance that can trigger, that can come in. I don't process serotonin properly. And so they put me on antidepressants a long time ago, and it took a long time for them to decide you know, that isn't helping. Mm -hmm. They did it just because they discovered my system didn't work properly, but it, it doesn't have a productive outcome. And that there that's such a balance line for so many topics. Yeah, that's a, um, I, I really like that you brought up the, the piece about grief because I don't think that that's addressed very often. Um, I know when my own mother was um, diagnosed originally, the doctor said, you know, it's really common for people to be diagnosed for depression um, and people don't look into dementia. And, um, you know, because there's, there's so much overlap between them. But, um, and I think the other thing too is that from what I've heard from all of you and, and so many others is you know, you don't just wake up one morning knowing this is what you have. You know things are changing. You're going through loss. There is this grief. It's not really talked about. So attitudes and, and affect, all that stuff are going to change because when that happens to any of us, dementia or not, that's what we do. You know, we're trying to fix it. We're trying to do our work around it, and we're not going to tell anybody because we want to be in control. I mean, those are all normal pieces of the process, but I think when dementia comes into play, it's, it's probably extended even more so um, because it just, and this is my observation, and please correct me if you don't agree, but, um, you know, the things just keep happening and it's like it doesn't snap out um, on a, and you're not, you don't go back to that normal base there. True, you have a comment? That's what I'm saying about the grief, because the mm -hmm. grief isn't a, oh, well, I already did that. Yep. You get a new symptom. Uh, I mean, uh, okay, I don't recognize my husband in the morning. I go through the grief. I don't, then two months later, I'm in the bathroom and I have no idea where I am, if he's even my house. It's another episode of grief, because I just stepped down a step. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's grief and then grief and then grief. It's not a one-time thing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of that, um, I think it's Paul Ann, I think it's, it's Paul Ann Boss, I believe, Boss or Boss. Um, and I should know that because she's in Minnesota here. <laughs> um, but she, she wrote a book about ambiguous loss where it's just this constant motion. It's not a one-time Thing. It's not like a, a death or a divorce where it's like, okay, boom, here's the deadline. You know, this, this has happened. And you, you step into a kind of a new period of life. It's you're stepping into the unknown constantly, um, both you and your care partners, you know, and, and that's, um, that's just got to be so emotionally draining on all of you and um, not not knowing if you if you end up thinking about it a lot. That's I mean that's a lot. That's weighted, big time. Brian, you're kind of shaking your head. What are some of your thoughts? 
Oh, there's so many. <laughs> um, you know, one of the one of the things that that I've experienced, and and I'm not trying to speak for everyone else, but it just what what I experience is that I, you know, ever since diagnosis, you're you're constantly, or I'm constantly looking back, um, trying to figure out when did this really start. I have an idea, and my family has an idea, but I think it goes further. Uh, beyond that um, and so that that's a little that's a little depressing to me because I feel like I've missed out on some things that maybe um, I would have enjoyed more if if I still remembered things and so forth but you fast forward to now and you know I don't have yes my wife is my my main caregiver but, you know, I also have a 22-year-old daughter and a 17-year-old son. And they care for me also. And it's, it's little things that, like this morning, my daughter brings my son to school. And she comes back home and she fixes her breakfast before she goes into work. Well, unbeknownst to me, um, well, I, I just got up from, from my chair came into the kitchen, uh, made some coffee, I put something in the microwave as she's sitting, standing at the stove. And she kind of, she didn't do it on purpose, she just kind of snapped at me. She says, why do you do this every single day? And I said, what do you mean? What did I do every single day? And she goes, when I'm starting to cook, you come in the kitchen and have to get into the microwave. <laughs> And I had, I had no idea. And I just looked at it and I said, I don't know, but I'm sorry. And I got, I got what, I don't even remember what I put in the microwave, but I got in there and then when I'm depressed, I shut down. I completely just shut down. And then you start thinking, what am I doing to my family? How do they, is that how they really feel? You know, I know they love me, but my, my interactions with them to me seem like nothing. But I know that there's some things that I do that annoy them every day from what, I, what I'm, and I ask them to be honest with me and that's why they tell me things. You know, I see my wife come home at the end of the day and she's dead tired from work. But then she feels like she's got to take care of me first. And I'm trying to explain to her that she doesn't have to do that. And right now I think of it. But sometimes when she comes home, I'm like a puppy dog. You know, it's like, hey, how you doing? How was your day? Tell me about you. You know, I just, I, I want to talk. I don't, I don't, I have no one to talk to except Dallas. And he can't talk. And he's not feeling good today. So now we're both depressed. <laughs> so it's, it's just, uh, it, it's kind of a, a vicious circle that we go through, that, well, that I go through, in that I try to remain positive because I know that's a key. And, and you know, I do pretty good at that. But there's a lot of times I just, I, I can't shake it. and they become the, the sounding board of my frustration of being what what's the word that what, what are we talking about? The depression. Depressed, yeah, depressed. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I better stop now. So I'm good. Did that make sense that it, that I that I ramble or? No, I think it made a lot of sense. And you know, when you um, when you were talking about you know why were you at the microwave? Well, I, for, this is outsider looking in, but I I see this all the time, um, not just with people with dementia, but even even people who do daycare. 
you know, they, they talk about, I need to talk to an adult, you know, because they feel isolated. They're talking with kids and they want to be part of that, you know, kind of that adult world. And so right. um, to me, it seems like it's, it's a comfort zone that you want to be part of that activity. You just want to be close. And, and I think sometimes care partners don't always understand um, that need just to be around and, and feel productive, or maybe it's just sitting on the couch next to them being quiet, but it's just, a, a, and, and I could be wrong, but I, what I hear people say is that there's just such a great sense of comfort. Now, I, I don't, don't get me wrong. I appreciate every single thing that they do, mm -hmm. but I, I do. I get very, <laughs> I get very excited when someone comes home, mm -hmm. you know, because I do, I, I'm, and I can't drive anymore, so I'm literally housebound unless I take an Uber somewhere. But when someone comes home, I have this this need to interact because I'm, you know, I'm, it, it's 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 lonely, you know. It's really lonely to be here, and. I'm sorry. No, we, we appreciate you being so honest because this is what people need to hear. This is what people need to understand. And I think all of our eyes are welling up right now because um, we can relate. Lori, you had a comment? Yeah, I agree with the loneliness thing. And I think that in itself can cause um, loneliness can cause a depression. And also put a lot of pressure on our caregivers. Um, my husband leaves the house at quarter of four every day. He gets home at 4.15. By the time he gets home, he's tired. He's worn out. Um, and he just wants to sit and relax. Meanwhile, I've been talking to the dogs, and sometimes they talk back. <laughs> but usually it's in a bark, and I don't understand bark. Um, but you even though you have chats and miss the, the connection, the camaraderie, you, especially, you know, I was used to being with people all the time. I, I worked full time. I was always involved with people. And now suddenly you're, you're cut off and you can't go, you can't really go anywhere and you're, you're kind of stuck. Um, then when Roy comes home, it's like, oh, how was your day? And I, I, I want him to pay attention to me because I haven't had anybody pay attention to me all day. I haven't had anybody to talk to. And these walls are closing in. It's like, you know, take me for a ride. Get me out of here. And he's tired. He, it's the last thing he must do is go take me somewhere. So I think we put a lot of, um, maybe stress on our care care partners not meaning to but that's uh in our frustration of cabin fever i think we're just excited to have somebody that we can touch mm -hmm. you know this group's great but i you know i can't touch you all and it <laughs> you need that contact yeah good point susan you had comment yeah, I'm um, so opposite from you guys. I spent my life in the service field, touching and connecting very deeply with people with very severe problems. I spent 20 plus years getting to know me through psychotherapy uh, so I could be the best person I could be. I really like that I don't have to connect in that way unless I choose to. Um, for me, it's a reprieve. Um, and instead, I watch my care partners under the assumption because they so, they're married. They come home and want to share their days. Typical most typical people do I get that they don't get that I really don't care 
<laughs> I don't really care what you did today. I, I, I hope it was a good day. I, I wish you no ill. But please don't jabber on and on to me about it. Because really, I, I may disappoint you. Because I won't show the same enthusiasm you have for that as I do. Uh, you know, as you do. Um, so I am on the opposite end of that. Um, maybe it's apathy. I'm not quite sure. But I've always been a very um, self-driven, self-reflective. Um, um, always was taught that if your best can be, then you project the best. So I've never relied on someone else to ensure me that I'm okie doke. I, I get that from internal. And if it's not okie doke, that's where my depression can come in because I, 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 I want to be in the place people recognize and I recognize as even keeled or, or, or finding joy where joy is applied and, and by a sadness where sadness is applied. Um, and I, I, I've, I work that out in my own mind. And since that takes longer than before, having that quiet isolation for me allows me to do that without it becoming a depressive state. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to go to Harry and then to Bob. I saw you both raise your hand. So Harry first and then Bob. I, I agree with Susan 100%. I think that now speaking for myself, I can see how, how further down the path of dementia I am than most of these people. Uh, I welcome the isolation. Um, I, I look at Brian and I say, oh my God, that was me five years ago. I mean, I had the same emotions, the same feelings he did. But today, I'm like Susan, I really don't care. Now, it's not, it's not that I don't care, but I can no longer process those thoughts. I realize I can't process those thoughts, so I don't. I just I just back away from them. I, I don't let those things as as a good as a good example, getting back to depression, one of the biggest things that depresses me is I stopped writing my thoughts on dementia. Now I stopped writing my thoughts on dementia for one reason and one reason only. And that's because of the personal attacks I was getting. I was, I was fighting, I was fighting these women every single day of my life. And I decided that um, it's not worth it to me. It's, it's not, I mean, it's dragging me down mentally, health-wise. Um, I miss it. Now, there is, there is a workaround. Um, now, I thought my own personal page was, was a safe place on Facebook, but it's not. Mm -hmm. So the only time I write my thoughts, I'm still writing my thoughts, but I'm writing it on my web page. Nobody can comment on them. They are my thoughts. I don't care what you think. To my thoughts. I don't care if you disagree with me. That doesn't matter to me anymore. You know, these are my thoughts. I want my thoughts to be down um, as a legacy of what I've been going through. Like the point I'm I'm trying to make is is I get to think about myself a lot. And um I'm further down the pipe than you think, you know, because of, 
I love these kind of chats because I hear these things and and I think to myself, oh my God, I used to think the same way, but the day's going to come when they realize too that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I can't smell. It doesn't matter if I can't taste things anymore. It's just, it's, it's a way of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Harry, those are um, powerful comments, and I'm I'm saddened that you um, have adapted to writing just on your website so that you don't get comments from people that are negative. Um, and I I wish and and it hurts so much, Lori. That's that's it. Now I, I get I get comments from hundreds of people that saying that um, I get comments from across the pond saying, Harry, we miss your thoughts. Mm -hmm. and, but it only takes, it only takes one person, <laughs> one person to, to hurt me mm -hmm. as bad as they did before. And I'm not, I'm not willing to go through that again. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's too bad you couldn't block that person, but you can't block them until you know that they're a jerk and gonna right. put, you know, and and not respect your thoughts. Because um, I have seen some of the attacks, and um, for people who are watching this, it's shocking. It is absolutely shocking how some uh, people have been attacked, and um, it, it's I mean, it's bullying is is bottom line what it is and um, I'm glad that you're still um, writing your thoughts and um, you know if you ever decide you want to and, and I don't know how often you do it but I'm always open to sharing those on the blog um, and pushing them out and then um, we can control comments with that because I, I do not allow people to to talk like that on my I just I just won't and pe and people have really been pretty good on the blog with commenting but I just I, I just don't want to allow that kind of um, activity I'm gonna <clears throat> true you had a quick comment I think and because I want to go to Bob but you had a comment you raised your hand quick and I yeah. don't was that I've been warned not to speak at Atlanta <laughs> oh. because that Oh, wow. That is really sad. Well, you will have a lot of support in Atlanta if anybody, um, I, I, that's just ridiculous. You know, people, I, I don't, I don't understand why people are so threatened by um, the comments that you guys have. Um, you're, you're so authentic and so sincere and it's not, from what I see, and what I deeply feel, none of, none of you are driven by ego. Um, this is really about trying to make the world a better place and to really raise awareness. And some people just seem to feel really threatened by having an authentic conversation. And that's, uh, that is depressing. Uh, no matter who you are, to feel you're being shut down and that your voice um, isn't valued. I mean, dementia or not, that that affects all of us. And true, I have I have two months to put on some muscle, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be your bodyguard. Okay, <laughs> if 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 I remember. Okay, so uh. <laughs> good. Um, Bob, oops, Bob, um, you were up next. Um, yeah. Um, it, it, this has been a real fascinating experience for me, uh, depression. Uh, I'm now about two and a half years since my diagnosis. Uh, the first six months, I caught, but I went down what I call depression, and my caregiver went down there with me. And it was a very difficult six months from that period. And it was around that time that I, I started to realize that uh, I have to get out of my cellar here. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, I'm self-defeating self myself. And um, what happened over the next year was uh, I found that uh, a lot of the things that I were doing individually, like uh, going to support groups, uh, spend more time with my grandchildren, spend more time with my family, was very important. But then came the word purpose. And the word purpose came, uh, and what I realized that my purpose is that everything I do should be directed towards reducing stigma. And the stigma is just 
stigma, since I've been diagnosed, uh, I understand what stigma really means now. And I can understand why other people are stigmatized. I understand and have more compassion for them. So I refuse, uh, I refuse to be stigmatized to the extent that I can. And what I, uh, what I found out around my depression was uh, that it's, I, diag I diagnosed it myself. It's fear. It's not depression. It's fear. It's not, in my particular case, it's fear. And uh, depression is a very involved uh, diagnosis and very difficult to treat. Fear you can treat. Fear I can take it on. I can, if I'm afraid of good, going out and give a talk, I go out and give a talk. If I'm afraid to do this, do that. Now I have more energy to take on my fear than I ever had before. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm doing pretty well right now uh, in, in living that way. And I'm very fortunate that where I'm living now, uh, my wife and I uh, had, had problems. And uh, we love each other. We just had that, that the caregiver and the Alzheimer person having that uh, irritability and anger and difficulty. So now she's living in her home. In our home, and I'm living at this in assisted living, and I couldn't be in a better place where I am right now. I still have a very close relationship with my wife. We go out together and have dinner, but we, we aren't. She doesn't have to take care of me anymore. She's relieved of that, and I'm now at the place where there are so many exciting things going on here at the All Center Resource Center that I'm very much involved in. So I'm so busy doing advocacy, doing dementia-friendly things, doing these sort of things. and But it's feeding into my sense of purpose in such a way that I, so far, I, it's always the dark thing at night. You know, the Alzheimer darkness is there, but during the day, I'm not carrying a weight anymore. So I'm, you know, how long will it last? I don't know, but I don't care. <laughs> Where I am right now is I'm really enjoying my life to the utmost. And I'm freer than I've ever been before because I don't have the self-image that I've had to protect for all these years. I make a mistake, I just bend my head over and say, I'm so sorry, I have Alzheimer's, right? And that works. And so, uh, I hope it lasts a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna work like hell to try to make sure it lasts a long time. But the fear, I actually done a, 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 a real, uh, I've been doing a lot of abstract art since, uh, I've got my uh, diagnosis, and uh, I did a painting on fear. And uh, what it was, what <clears throat> I had the, uh, I, I talk light is, is a, is a, it comes into your, into your emotional set that you can deal with your fear and it helps you on how to do it. And I have this yellow light, in fact, no, you can't see, it's too small, but, uh, but, so I have the the, the, uh, the light coming down this way, and on this, then I have an overlay with my fears. And I show this uh, when I speak, I show how some of these fears have now been pretty much resolved. They've moved up to the top into the yellow, but I've added my new fears. And so I'm consistently facing these fears. And facing the fears is the purpose I want. And, and so I'm not, I'm not depressed. I'm not depressed in, 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 in that sense as a result of my Alzheimer's, even though I was at one time. Now I understand, you know, with uh, some of the people who are on the show that depression for some is different for others. But in my particular situation uh, uh, is the energy that comes to me when uh, they give me something I'm afraid to do. Okay. So that's, okay. that's where I am right now. Okay, so you're a fear fighter. And just kind of a little warrior um, tackling right. those things, knowing that you will pull it into the light and knowing dang well there's going to be another fear that pops yeah. up and it's There's not going away. Fear. Always <laughs> a fear. You can count it on the fear. 
Yep. You can't cut the light too much, but you cut it appear. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Susan, how about you? What are what are some of your thoughts on this? I think Lori had her hand up first. Oh, okay. I, I saw you looked pretty emotional earlier. Um, and, and I just wanted to give you a chance Thank to, you. To, to share. And I did see Lori. So um, it, it's, I think, Lori, is it okay if Susan goes right now? Okay. I think that you're making points of, um, of Bob about fear and um, is a, a really valid one. To hear um, uh, 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 Brian uh, uh, talk so emotionally of mm, sadness, of grief, and, and Lori, lonely, and, 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 and Harry, um, I will use the word a little more um, apathetic or less connected to depression than once before. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, To me, the common thing that keeps coming back is um, the personal experience. Um, but it seems to bounce off of uh, who we will are and how others perceive us. Um, and um, it makes me sad not depressed, but sad that um, you feel needy and you, you feel less than because you are so anxious to see your loved one come home and you feel like a puppy dog um, or, or that you don't care anymore or you feel like you've lost the ability to um, or that you're in the way and how does that make others feel? That to me is sadness. Uh, that we are this disease. Twist the perception of self in a way we know familiar, but constantly trying to express to others so they love us and they want to be near us for as long as possible without us looking as though we are something they don't recognize. That to me is sad. Um, recognizing change and what I going to do about there's no change just sad me it's how I see you and you and you and my loved one how they interpret and how they manage it that can bring sadness to me not me <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm just cold heart. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Label me with something else. Go ahead. I don't care. <laughs> so, Susan, let me ask you this. Um, you talk about um, sadness, not depression. Because I think a lot of times people think when they're sad, they're depressed. Mm -hmm. And and you you seem to look at that in, in two different lights. And, and, um, and I think a, a lot of people... I, I think a lot of people just don't think about it that much to talk about the different normal emotions that exist and they kind of get categorized into a depression um, instead of something that um, is fluid and, and you can move through it. Um, and again, you know, when it's true depression, you can't always move through it um, and there's assistance needed. So um, uh, how, um, I guess why how did you come to separating the two or is that just something you've always done well I do have 20 plus years of psychotherapy so I have a huge chul chest of <laughs> things to reach into I think everyone should go to therapy because things happen in life that you might need some help 
-hmm. It's called life. And if you don't hit bumps, then you may not be experienced everything. So I do have a good tool chest. I'm very aware of what uh, clinical depression is. Been there. Been there. I have tried every antidepressant under the sun. I've been labeled many things that turned out no to be. So when I feel the sadness that seems to want to feel a little clingy for a while um, and starts to make it feel confused, I bounce it off of people. Um, I check it. My perception may be incorrect. And I'm the first to say if be wrong. I will speak with my physician. Uh, maybe we should try a round of antidepressants. Um, depression for me is like a large dark cloak that weighs about 100 pounds. And trying to get that cloak off is often very, very difficult. So I don't even want to slip it on for size. <laughs> um, I've been there, and I do recognize how hard it can be to shake it. With dementia, what I have found is that it isn't clinical depression because the meds do not work me. Well, I tried. I'm open to everything to try, but it didn't all work. So I reverse back to the tool chest full of inner reflection, writing, reaching out to others, uh, finding a different purpose so that I can move from sadness to fulfillment once again. For me, that seem to work wonderful well thank you for sharing that i i think that it's um it's nice to hear even about you know the med situation and that there because i think a lot of times people just think that's the only resource you know give me a pill to fix it let me move on and and there's so many different things that can be done kind of with dementia no we don't have a cure but there's a lot of things we can do to help people live better with this you know, in totality. Um, Lori, <clears throat> why don't you go ahead, and, and I know that you had a question about um, siblings, and, and uh, you know, if that makes a difference in a family growing up in a full house and, and things like that. So, um, floor is yours. I like Susan calling it sadness rather than depression, because mm -hmm. I, I do believe that's, that's a lot of what it is, is a sadness, a, a loss, and a sadness. Um, but I have found that when I'm when I'm feeling sad um, about things I've lost the ability to do or about uh, the weight of what I'm doing to my family weighs very heavily on me. I have found that my way of handling it is often to make myself look for things to be grateful for, to go outside and look at the birds and, and say, Geez, Look how beautiful they are and I'm so grateful that I live in the area that I do that I can see so much and I I really try to just find as many things I can to be grateful to make me smile again and make me get my mind off it but I had a question because we had different versions as to who liked being alone versus who liked um, missed their spouse not missed or didn't like being in the house alone and that is how has your household uh population been i was one of six kids there was eight of us living in a house with one bedroom or one bathroom thank goodness there was more than one bedroom holy crap um one bathroom and and all through my life i've had a house full of of people uh, we used to swear that my mother her way of getting us home on time was if we got home late somebody else was in our bed because there was always people dropping in to visit and you, you wouldn't have a bed if you weren't home on time so I was used to always having people and so I'm wondering if if Brian Harry and Susan 
have been used to a house full of constant people or not? Good question. Brian, how about you? I grew up in a family of, there were five of us and um, my parents, of course, in a three bedroom house. Um, my parents had their room, my sister had her room, and then four of us <laughs> were in one room. Um, now, as a little kid, I didn't really care. You know, I was, I've always been around, and my family, my extended family is, is huge. And, um, but then when I got married, um, it was, it was smaller. Um, things were things were different and then as I got older everything kind of got smaller and I guess that's just the way it is when you uh, when you age um, but now you know we're a family of four and everybody has their own thing you know my wife works during the day my son works uh, uh, goes to school during the day and then he works at night. My daughter works during the day. And, you know, she has a boyfriend that she talks to on the computer all the time. So she's in her room. My son's in his room when he's not at work and playing video games. And then it's basically just my wife and I. And, um, and, and she's told me before that when she comes home, all she wants to do is de-stress. So she doesn't want to talk about her day. She doesn't want to answer any questions. She just wants to come home, get undressed, and relax. Now, there's the puppy dog here <laughs> who is just, my head's about to explode because I want to know why she's either sad, angry, stressed, but I'm not supposed to ask, ask, ask those questions because all it does is make her more, uh, it um, makes her situation worse than what it already is. So I just kind of sit there in my chair and watch TV and pretend that it doesn't bother me. And uh, she knows it does. And uh, if she wants to talk about it, she will. But if she doesn't, then I, I never know. And, but yet everybody wants to find out what's wrong with me. And <laughs> if I shut down, then it's like, oh, what's the matter? What's the matter? And I say, oh, it's all right for you not to talk to me, right? So then I become, you know, I become the jerk. <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't happen all the time. And, and I'm not saying that it's, it's a horrible life because it's not, because they take care of me and they love me and I know I wouldn't be able to do it um, without them. Um, it's just the, I like to give the whole picture of what, of what goes on because so many people don't know. They, they see me on the outside giving presentations and talking and being very animated and making jokes and all this stuff. And I wish I had uh, cameras all around the house to show people what actual life is like living with this disease. And it's not always a pretty picture. It's not always a party. And um, I wish they would see more of that instead of just what's on the outside. Good point. I think it's, it's also a good point in terms of, um, a, in a great example that you shared with, you know, your wife just needing that downtime, that quiet time. I don't, and we all need that, but it, when we're care partners, we, we're in this mode that we're supposed to fix it. And um, I mean, I, I, I saw that with my mom. I see that even with my grandkids, if they're struggling um, or, or, you know, my daughter, you know, you, 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 sometimes we push too much wanting to help instead of just saying, you know what, I'm going to give you some quiet time. I'm here if you want to talk about it and giving people right. space. We don't always respect that no matter what someone's condition is, they just might need some space like the rest of us do. And, and focusing on that that's a common need of all people. 
And I'm not um, ignorant to that fact. Yeah. I know that she needs that, that de-stress time. I mean, she is the operations manager for a, um, a, a HUD property. It has 200 units and she runs the whole thing. So when, you, when you're dealing with um, government run uh, places like that, it, 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 can get, it can get pretty dicey. And um, sometimes I, there's a lot that she won't tell me because she knows that I'm going to worry, you know, about her. Um, and that's just, the, and that was like that before um, I, I, I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So, um, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's just a strange situation, Yeah. but I love her to death because <laughs> she's, she's my best friend. Great. Harry, you had some comments. It looked like I look, I look at Brian and Brian gave the, the perfect explanation that every care partner says and he is the one living with the disease and it's so it is so ironic because his fears and concerns is what almost every care partner goes through the exact same thing exactly what they were saying in every household to see the same thing that people um, they're afraid to say anything because they don't want to upset. You know, he gave the perfect speech on that. Well, thank you, Harry. Yep. Except you're living with Alzheimer's. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> who are you? Who are you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, Susan, any final comments from you? I think it's a give and take. Um, I think with dementia, personally, the perceptions um, and time to perceive, even if skewed, um, are there. Um, so we may have the time for m more inflection and reflection than our busy care partners have. Um, or may it be a gift from dementia? I'm not sure. Um, but recognizing that it is um, a sadness that is felt by both sides for maybe different reasons or at different times. And learning how to, as you would any friend, just be there. And um, don't always try to fix it unless their hand's caught in something. Otherwise, you know, if it's not bleeding, let it go. Um, but to just be there for each other, recognizing that um, this too shall pass um, to a point of it won't be as important or the same things won't <coughs> have the same impact be patient be still with one another check it out but don't try not to impose yourself on one another in a way that increases the frustration or sadness but just lets one another know that we recognize and are there for one another Good point. You know, one of the things that we didn't really talk about um, that just hit me when you were when you were talking, Susan, was, you know, you'd mentioned about, you know, letting it go and letting it be. But I think the other piece is um, when you said, you know, listen and, and validate somebody's feelings, because if if we know it's OK to feel that way, it helps us, I think, all get through it. But when we try to hide it or pretend it doesn't exist or we're fearful of talking about it, it creates more angst, more frustration, more sadness. And, and I think that that's, you know, part of the problem, you know, um, with depression, with any type of mental illness in general, in the whole public is this huge fear of not 
talking about our feelings, not talking about our emotions. And um, I, I think when we can validate, you know, and, and not fix, because it's not our responsibility to fix one another, though we all seem like we, we think we're supposed to, you know, that, you know, that if we can really validate and listen, we're going to gain some insights. We're going to give and receive comfort and we're going to get to the core of our relationships of what makes us close. And, um, and not that there couldn't be a point where the line is, is crossed and you think somebody really needs maybe medical intervention or go to the doctor because it, it, it's not um, correcting itself. Um, I, you know, I'm not saying that, but give it a chance um, to try to find some other alternatives and to not make it be abnormal because sadness and, and even parts of depression, depending on how people define it, are pretty dang normal. I mean, if we looked at how many people are even on medications for that or going to a counselor, um, you know, a psychiatrist or psychologist, I think people would be shocked because it's kind of like dementia. People don't talk about that. And, um, you know, uh, the more we can speak honestly and openly i think it just removes a lot of the fear and the sadness you know from that um brian any last comments for you yeah i, I just wanted to to say this my wife has a knack for uh knowing what my happy places are and um one of course uh, i know you all know is disney world <laughs> for me um another is uh music and thirdly is is the beach now you know we're we're very blessed to live you know 15 minutes away from the beach and um people see pictures of us out on the beach and they say oh you know y'all are you know so lucky and this that and the other but for it's twofold for both her and i because we go out there and we hardly say a word to each other we just sit in our chairs underneath the umbrella and just be and you listen to the surf you listen to the the birds you know if we get there early enough and then then the people come and then we see the little babies in the sand and you see all this activity and it's just one of the most relaxing things that we do and then there's the music so every tuesday night they have what they call bands on the beach so tonight we're going out to the beach to listen to music well <laughs> that's like a win-win-win-win <laughs> situation for me because it 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 really solves a lot of a lot of my my issues i i i noticed that i, and I didn't even realize that i did this um, I put a hashtag uh, from this past weekend, and it said, uh, hashtag, no Alzheimer's here. <laughs> because when I'm, when I'm involved in something like that, there, Alzheimer's is not existent in that moment. I am transported back to who I used to be. And it's absolutely wonderful. So that's why she does what she does. Um, and I have to wrap my head around it. That It's like, oh, man, that is so nice of her to you know, bring me. And I say, oh, she's, she's doing it for me, but she's doing it to give me a break from this. And, uh, and it works. Mm, so. Great. Well, thank you. Lori, any last comments from you? Well, I, I'm actually opposite from Brian in that I wouldn't be able to stand the crowd, the noise, the kids, the, the music, and I miss that. But to me, when I've been on a beach, it, it's too noisy, too crowded. Mm -hmm. So it, with dementia, we all have our different things that um, we're all different. We're all unique. And for some of us, sound affects us very badly. Mm -hmm. um, for others, it's something uh, it's something else. It depends on which neurons in our brain are going to, to what we can handle. Um, but I think 
for our care partners to be aware of what our happy place is and how to help us get there and to want to be there with us is so important. And I'm glad I have that in, in my life that Roy can identify that. Harry, any, any other last comments from you? Now the the only thing I'd I'd like to say is you don't have to say a word to connect. Two people can be sitting side by side and if they know how to do it, they can be connected. Mm -hmm. I don't even think we know how to do it, we just do. You know. Mm -hmm. Comes from being with somebody for a long time. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't think we answered the question, uh, depression or uh, dementia first, um, but I think we gave some really great insights to people about um, depression and sadness and grief and, um, and, and maybe even switching some of the terminology that people frame it with um, might help. Um, and like Susan had mentioned, kind of building that tool chest of, you know, what makes you happy? What can, what did you call it? Your chill chest, I think. <laughs> and, um, and being able to build on those resources. And uh, I think for people to realize, you know, for each person, it's going to be different. You know, some people really want that contact and want a physical hug. Others are very content, you know, with the quiet. And so don't, don't think that there's a one way, you know, you, you've got to have these conversations with people. And, um, and I think if we can all learn to, um, to be better at letting go and not trying to fix, even though our care partners are always trying to, to, to fix and help and, and support somebody with dementia, they have to realize a person with dementia is still trying to do the same for them. And they have the same worries. They have the same concerns. And when we're when we're not able to do that for somebody, dementia or not, you know, it's going to cause some feelings, some frustration, some sadness, maybe even some anger, because we want we want to be part of supporting that person, um, no matter who we are. And again, looking at the commonalities versus the differences. So um, thank you guys so much. I just think this, this was a wonderful conversation. And I know that Bob and True had to drop off for other appointments. So um, again, thank you so much. And for our listeners, you know, please share this video. Um, this is why we do these. Um, if you, you know, find that it's helpful, uh, share. So thanks so much. Until next time. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.